Rapture should promote holy living. Jesus is coming back. Seek those things that are above, as we saw a moment ago. But look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. By the way, my dear Catholic friends, Christ was offered once. No, no, to bear the sins of many. Jesus, was, Jesus only suffered once. He doesn't suffer at every sacrament or every communion service. He only suffered once. Jesus, Jesus suffered once on the cross, never to suffer again. Your, your, high, your priest is in heaven. Your priest is Jesus Christ. He suffered for the sins of many. Listen, there's, listen, there is a caveat to this. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Are you eagerly waiting for him? Does the thought that Jesus could come today excite you? Let, yeah, let's be honest. Let's feel really honest about this. That the thought of him coming, if you, if you start to backslide, you know, love should keep you going, first of all. It's your love. You always want to pray, Lord, cause my heart to love you more every day. Don't let me grow cooler. Let me grow hotter in love for you, Jesus. But if anything goes cockeyed and weird with my heart, you get a hold of me, Jesus. If that doesn't do it, may the fear of the Lord keep me out of trouble. All right? If that doesn't do it, may the sheer terror that you could come back and I'm involved in something I ought not to be keep me out of trouble. You know, sometimes we need a little bit of an admonition, you know, and an exhortation. Kids are like that. Look, Junior, do it because you love me. Well, you get the attitude. Okay, then do it because I told you to do it. And that doesn't do it either. Then look at Junior and say, if you don't do it, <laughs> no cookie for you. You know what I'm saying? You want to do it out of the right heart, out of the right drive. Number five, I'm going to speed up for time. It matters because the rapture is the great separator. The rapture is very clear in the Bible. It separates. Listen, the believer from the unbeliever at the time of the rapture, a world is separated. This is where a lot of people who argue against the rapture, they get all sweaty with this one. Let me tell you something right now. The rapture is an event in the Bible. We saw that in a few scriptures. It has its purpose and its motive and its, and its reason. And I'm submitting to you today that one of them is that it's a separator. Why would God separate his people from a Christ-rejecting world? Listen, according to the book of Isaiah and according to the book of Revelation, there are those who are called earth dwellers. I love the old King James calls it earth dwellers. Those who dwelled on the earth, they, the hailstones, the fire, all this stuff's written in the Bible. But it has nothing to do with the church. And it has nothing to do, by the way, with the believing house of Israel. In the tribulation period, they're protected by God. Remember, it's a Christ-rejecting world that is shaking their fist at God, the Bible says. And then, listen, instead of repenting, the Scripture says, it says that they shake their fist at God and they hide themselves in the rocks and the cliffs of the world to shelter themselves from the wrath of the Lamb of God. They cannot believe. They refuse to believe. The Bible tells us that the rapture will separate us from an unbelieving world. Look, if you have a hard time with that, read your Bible some more. It's in the scriptures. It's going to happen. But look, I'm speaking to a house of believers. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, or Paul said, in a twinkling of an eye, we'll be caught up to meet the Lord. We'll be changed. That ought to excite you. If you don't get excited over that, I don't know. Something's interesting with you. That's weird. <laughs> Galatians 5.5 5 says, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That's a reference to his coming. His righteousness is coming. What a great thing. Number six. It matters because the rapture delivers us from that wrath we were talking about. Okay, get ready. Here we go. People will say, you guys, you know what? You just, it's escapism. That's what you're all into. 
You just want to escape the escapism. <laughs> Listen, I do everything I can to escape. For example, look, I live, in, I live in Southern California, one of the most expensive places in the world to live. Okay, I'll do anything and everything I can to escape having to pay full price for anything. Okay, Amir thinks he's Jewish. I'm Jewish. I'm not going to pay full price. I want a coupon. I want a deal. Escape. Listen. It's fun. It's, I, mean, I don't mean this in a funny way. It's ironic. It's funny. It's strange. People are trying to escape flooding in Houston. They're not standing there going, come on, water. I'm not afraid of you. Bring it. Listen, when an earthquake happens in Southern California, no one goes down to the beach. Why? A tsunami warning has been issued. So why? So you escape the tsunami. Anybody would know this. Well, listen to this. Luke 12, beginning at verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. Verse 37, blessed are those servants whom, when the master, when he comes, will find them watching. Verse 40, therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Why? Because the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 21, off my head, it's coming, verse 36, I believe it is, that we're to be watching and waiting for him, because if we do, we are going to escape all those things that shall come to pass upon the earth. The Bible even uses the word escape. Escape, sign me up. You have to apologize for that. But listen, it's not because we're cowards. It's because God has promised us to spare us from the wrath that is going to be poured out. We're going to be delivered from that wrath. Number seven, it matters because the rapture belongs to the church. It is a church possession. Listen, the rapture from the scripture doesn't belong to the Old Testament saints. Listen, it doesn't belong to uh, the believing house of Israel. That's for later. The rapture of the church does not belong to the tribulation saints. They're not raptured. There's a certain group of believers that is designated for the rapture, and it's called the Bride of Christ, the church. Think of it. Go study and see what the Bible says about that. It's exclusively belonging to the church. Remember what Jesus said in John 14? Remember what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4? Speaking to the church, the rapture. Revelation chapter 4, you want to talk about it belonging to the church? We mentioned it earlier. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, John is speaking, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. must take place. What's it say? After this. So now we're in a chronology. Something's up. Verse 2. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and like a sardis stone in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne there were 24 thrones, and on the thrones there were 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne there were Four living creatures, this is freaky, full of eyes in front and in the back. Okay, that's freaky. <laughs> the first living creature was like a lion. So it's not a lion, it's like a lion. What does that mean? And the living, another living creature like a calf. The third living creature was, or had a face of a man or like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. This is weird. It has one head, but with four faces. 
The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. And this is what they say. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The Bible says Jesus is the creator of all things. Revelation 19, verse 18. After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to our Lord God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Verse 3, again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne forever saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. As the sound, this is Revelation 19 now, remember that. The sound of, uh, sounded like many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Go find out who that is. You need to know who that is because she's in heaven. She got there somehow. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. I had the high honor one time of asking Dr. John Wolverd in person, Sir, it's interesting, they don't, they're not mentioned having robes. They're mentioned here having fine white linen. And he said, young man, that's interesting. That's all, that's all he said. It was... Look, from John Wolvert, I was honored. He said it was interesting. (laughs) But isn't it interesting? She's got fine linen, clean and right. Go look at that. Find out what it is. You're going to find out that it's apparel that's in association to a wedding. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 11, now I saw him who opened, uh, uh, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judge and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Pause right there. Jesus in heaven right now looks like this. This is hard for us from Southern California because everything we have on our walls, every children's ministry coloring book has got Jesus looking like he just got off a surfboard. He's got a great robe on. He's got windswept hair. It looks like a surf guy. He doesn't look like a surf guy. This is what he looks like. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. By the way, I'm going to submit to you that that robe was bloodied during the tribulation period. Think of it. And his name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen. There she is. She's an army dressed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness, and there's the word, wrath. You've been hearing about it all day. The wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's awesome. That's Jesus. I thought you'd be excited about that. But anyway, number eight. Number eight, it matters because the rapture is the ultimate act of mercy upon us for God. It's an act of mercy for us. Let's be honest. Do we deserve hell? Yes, we do. His grace is what's going to get you into heaven. 
Do we not deserve to be disciplined at every moment? Yes, we do. Mercy. I'm going to submit to you today that number eight is the rapture is God's act of his ultimate mercy for the church. He gets us out of here before the world is punished for their sins. That's very important. Number nine, I'm running now. I'm out of time. I have one minute. It matters because the rapture is in the believer's DNA. Look, I'm sorry if I upset you, but if the Holy Spirit is doing it, then God bless you. But I believe that the doctrine of the rapture of the church and the imminent return of Christ is the Holy Spirit's imprint of the DNA of the Spirit in the life of the believer. I cannot imagine a Christian reading the Bible and then saying, well, I hope the Lord doesn't come back soon. I don't understand that. That's number nine. And number 10, I end with this. Only the rapture and the doctrine of it answers the teaching of expectancy in Scripture. Listen, quick, I end. Are you ready for this? Book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, gave the Jewish people an outline for the coming of the Messiah. The book of Daniel is the book that says in the 483rd year of Israel's special dealings with God and God with Israel, there's 490 of them, years. At the 483rd year, the Messiah would come to Israel. Did you know it says that in the book of Daniel? You say, I've never heard that before. Just hang on. It says it. The same next sentence in Daniel 9 says, but the Messiah will be cut off. The word is karat. He, he will die. The Messiah of Israel will die. Every Jew knows this. It says it in Daniel. Fast forward. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Do you remember what he said? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who stones the prophets who are sent to you. How often I would have gathered you together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Here's the indictment, but you were not willing. So now behold, your house is left to you desolate. You will not see me again until you say to me, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When, did Jesus, when was Jesus crucified? What, what year was that? Jesus was crucified, died, and rose again from the dead on the 483rd year of a 490-year prophecy. God promised 490 years to Israel. On the 483rd year, Jesus dies exactly what Daniel prophesied in Daniel 9. Jesus' first coming to Israel was on Palm Sunday, not Bethlehem's birth. He expected them to know the day of their visitation. He said, because you didn't recognize the day of your visitation. Now all peace has gone from you. They should have gotten up that morning and looked at their calendar and said, based upon Daniel, today's the day the Messiah comes to the nation of Israel. That's the first physical coming of Christ to the nation of Israel. It happened on the, te on the Temple Mount, or excuse me, it happened on the Mount of Olives. Jesus went to the Temple Mount, declared himself that week to be who he was, and the people didn't receive him. The second coming of Jesus Christ to Israel. Where does he land? Where does he put his foot? Mount of Olives, same landing course. He goes through the eastern gate. He goes to the Temple Mount. He establishes the throne of David from the Temple Mount location because we believe in the millennium. Jesus has never sat on the throne of David. He must do it. And I submit to you today that the book of Daniel told the Jewish people his first coming in that book. And the Bible tells us in Daniel the second coming it's a Jewish thing. In the middle is a thing called the rapture. It's not a coming. It's an appearing.